Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar, Best Practices for Designing IoT Security. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This presentation will last approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes of questions and answers. This is, webinar is also being recorded and a copy um, of this deck along with the recording will be sent to you after the webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our presenter, Hugo Fines, CEO of Electric Imp. Now, if you don't know, Hugo is a serial innovator and entrepreneur. After successfully creating and launching two companies, Apple recruited Hugo to develop the first four generations of the iPhone. He then went on to Nest, where he realized that connected devices were going to change the world for the better, but not only if but only if they were secure, maintainable, and inflexible. So in 2011, Hugo co-founded Electric Imp Secure IoT Connectivity Platform. With that, I would like to welcome Hugo and hand this presentation over to him. Hugo, take it away. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so this, uh, I'm gonna to talk today about, uh, I'm gonna get my mouse control right, oops. I'm gonna to talk, talk today about, about uh, Architects and security uh, in IoT devices. Um, we've got a, a little poll question first, which I think uh, Karen's gonna gonna take care of, and then we'll get into it. This is a, a presentation mainly aimed at people, you know, designing and building and having to ship IoT devices, uh, and who will be responsible for things like security in them. So the the first poll should have popped up for you. Do you have an IoT project underway? Uh, and if yes, do you have security guidelines in place today? Um, it's very important, as the, the title of the presentation suggests, that uh, IoT security is something you consider from the very beginning of a project. And it's a very hard thing to add. But anyway, um, the poll is up there. If you, if you click, and then we'll, we'll move on to the actual presentation. OK. We'll just give it a couple of seconds, and then I will end the poll so that everybody can see the results. Okay, I'm, it's uh, very heartening to see that, that people have IoT security guidelines in place, at least some of the people, that's a, that's a good thing. I've actually been giving variants of this presentation for uh, several years at, at different different events, things like uh, ST DevCon, Arm Tech Con, and so on. And it's been very interesting that, that uh, you know, the, the interest in security has moved from more theoretical to, to actual practical concerns. Anyway, let's get going. Oops. So what we're going to cover today, I mean, realistically, you're not going to cover an entire subject like security in a, in a webinar. This is really just to intend to, intended to ensure that you have a slightly more complete list of things to worry about. Um, security is one of those things which you can go almost to any depth in. Um, but there are some sort of high level items here which we're, we're covering, which are things that, that hopefully everyone will have thought of when they're, they're building their IoT devices. Um, one of the other critical points here is architecting and building a secure system requires experience and detailed knowledge of many disparate fields. This is one of the few times when both embedded and, and server people have to get together and agree on things, things they may not have the same opinion on, um, which is unusual in computing. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there, has, there has been generally a, a big uh, gulp, sorry, gulf between these two fields, um, uh, and now they're having to get together and build actually working systems that are long-lasting as well. Um, building this stuff in house is possible. It's not easy, um, and there there are small terms of approaches as well, which is uh, sort of kind of that's the point of Electric Imp. Anyway, so other important points before we start, um, it's important to recognise that there is no such thing as absolute security. Um, there is no way of saying yes, this device is secure. Uh, it is secure against, you know, the attacks it was designed to be secure against. However, you can't, there's no such thing as a, an absolutely secure device. Every system will have weaknesses. It depends on whether the attackers are suitably motivated to exploit them. So, uh, you know, in some, in some cases, if you're, if you're designing, you know, centrifuges for, for nuclear enrichment, you may have a different level of paranoia to make sure um, nation states aren't interfering with them. Um, and really, you know, it, that will just affect the cost. Um, security is also iterative. So it is not a, a thing where you can declare something secure and it will stay secure. Something which is declared secure on Monday could be insecure by Tuesday, depending on what weaknesses uh, exist in there in, in both your code and your libraries and the hardware and so on. Um, so security is really a continuum. Um, it's about 
monitoring the exploits, monitoring the devices in the field, uh, uh, analyzing attacks and patching and updating these devices as soon as possible. It's really time to fix uh, is the important thing there. And it's over the entire life of the product. So there is no point where you can go, ah, I shipped this product five years ago, um, no more updates, uh, unless you're actually gonna take the product offline at that time. Uh, and this is a, the last point uh, is really something which is happening less and less now. Um, but when I first started giving this presentation, this was actually something people were doing, which is a build, ship, and forget. They just ship it with one version of software and move on to the next thing and never update it. Uh, that's becoming rarer and rarer, which is a very good thing. Uh, that does mean that there are a lot of other parts of the system that have to be well designed. But anyway, that's, that's kind of the, just, just the, the top three points before we, we start. Um, there's a general question. Why be so concerned about IoT security? So I think one of the things here uh, is this is different to a lot of other fields of computing. Um, IoT devices are generally long lasting. Uh, if they're in home infrastructure, for example, they could be around for 10, 15 years. They could even be much longer than that in industrial infrastructure. So they'll operate in the field for many years and you may not know they've been compromised. Um, some of the, the attacks that have happened on IoT devices haven't impacted or not significantly impacted the normal operation of the device. So people are going, well, everything's still working. It doesn't seem broken. It's just the device is also moonlighting, doing a whole lot of nefarious work for, for some remote hacker somewhere. Um, the other point is no application is safe. So if you just say, yeah, well, why, why would anyone hack my toaster? If you're making connected toaster, for example, it isn't the point. They're not hacking it because they want to make your toast burnt in the morning and start your day off badly. They're hacking it because it has power and has a network connection. And as such, it can be a, a distributed denial of service participant. They're, they're wanting it because it's, it's a, essentially a node which they can control. Um, they're valuable to someone. Um, also, you know, a device that's hacked can cause massive problems. Uh, it, it can get you into, uh, you know, behind firewalls and networks and so on. And so a compromised device is, it can be a dangerous thing. Uh, and lastly, you know, the reputation in connected devices is, is a fragile thing. Um, you don't want to be the company that's known for the devices that were hacked and caused some other problem. Um, you know, you really have to put the work in advance to make sure you're not that company. So next thing is why from the ground up? Um, really security is one of those things which is very hard to add. Taking an existing system that's like finished and it's like, okay, now make this secure is very, very hard. There's almost every design decision, uh, everything from flash layout to you know, PCB layout to actually the end user functions can be influenced by security and you know, security will actually inform some of those decisions. It's gonna cost money to do this before you ship and it's gonna cost money after you ship. So people who design a product and they have just enough in the budget and they go, okay, we've, we've got the product done, we've got this much set aside for security, then we'll ship it and then it'll be great. Um, you know, it, and haven't accounted for the ongoing cost, that's a, a, a bad problem in terms of this has to be built into the budgeting for the connected product. It's not something you can have as a single line item. You know, you'd have to work out the amortized cost for the, device, the, the security maintenance for devices in the field. That's very important. And that's one of the things which, you know, don't want to just concentrate on the technical points here, uh, really the, the actual structural points of, you know, how a company can build and responsibly ship uh, connected devices are important. Um, and, and the whole company, not just the engineering department, need to be aware of this. They need to be aware there are ongoing costs and there are ongoing risks. Uh, there are obviously great rewards as well for good IoT. However, it, it's not as simple as, as just we'll do these, these technical things right and you, you're, you're good. Um, you need to make sure you have the budget. You don't want to have the thing where an exploit comes out and engineering is saying, well, you know, we, we just need a, a couple of people for a month to, to sort this problem out. Uh, and the accounting go, well, you can't have the money and, and you know, the, the device gets, gets hacked and is, is insecure and, and is a problem just because there was no budgeting for that. So moving on to the next thing, threat modeling. So really one of the things about uh, securing uh, security in general um, is that you need to have an idea of, of what threats you're actually worried about. Um, so there are, you know, give an example of a toaster, for example, you know, you may be worried about safety things. You have a heating element and a high power device. It's like, okay, I'm worried about attacks that could cause uh, overheating uh, safety risks and so on. Um, you need to, every product will be different. Every product will have different worst case outcomes. 
Um, and then you can look at the mitigation steps to prevent those outcomes from happening. There may be some outcomes you're not that worried about, uh, and, and hence you can emphasize the, the concentration on those slightly less. Um, again, there's always going to be more than enough work to go around to actually secure a device. So one thing, the things we're going to kind of talk about here, some of the categories of attacks uh, that typically happen on, on IoT devices. The number one is physical. So this is something which actually general people like you know doing server side security don't generally worry about you don't worry about well what if someone hacks into the amazon data center or actually walks into the amazon data center and uh, and, and gets my server and, and pulls the hard disk out or something that's unlikely because there are physical safeguards in place however with an iot device the devices are out in the world you don't know necessarily where they are uh, and if a device goes offline it could be because there's been a power outage in that location or it could be because someone has unplugged it and um, we did actually have a customer who had a they, 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 they claim they had a Wi-Fi problem, the device had gone offline, and, and they actually went to the site and found someone had stolen the Wi-Fi router, which was why it wasn't online. Um, you know, the, the world, you don't have full visibility. So physical attacks are very possible, where people will actually have your device, they'll take it apart, they'll put it in a lab, they'll decap the chips, they'll do all sorts of power analysis and so on on it. That's one category of attack. It's pretty hard to, to, to protect against, but there are safeguards, safety guards you can do. Um, local network attacks are ones where generally, you know, you're behind a firewall, you can actually do high volume attack traffic, fuzzing and things like that on a, on a device on the local network. It's harder to do uh, remotely. Um, uh, and remote attacks are the man in the middle, typically ones where you sit between uh, the device and the server it's trying to communicate with uh, and, uh, and try messing with the data there. And, and there's a whole lot of things on, on trans transport security I'll talk about there. And the other one is server side attacks, which is often people attacking APIs on the server side. Um, but attacks often come at inconvenient times, um, you know, like when you're provisioning it, when it's first coming online, or when it's in a vulnerable state because it's, it's trying to do a firmware update at that time. Um, so really, you know, security, it's not just a steady state. Uh, it's the times when it's doing other things which are unusual, um, and the attacker may actually find that the weakness is there and, and use that to exploit your device. I've kind of divided attacks into a couple of categories here, uh, annoying versus dangerous. Uh, the annoying attack is like, you know, well, if a, an attacker has physical access to a device, they can, uh, they can compromise device operation. Now, you know, that could be they've got it on their bench with, uh, you know, a logic analyzer attached and they're, they're glitching power, or it could just be they've hit it with a hammer. Um, and, and really, you know, you, it's very easy to prevent a device working. Um, you know, you can prevent most wireless devices working with a wireless jammer. Um, you know, Wi-Fi D off tool, whatever you want to do there. However, uh, that's only an annoying attack. You know, it's affected that one device, generally requires locality, um, and doesn't mean that other devices in the field are susceptible to a repeatable attack. The real dangerous attacks are the ones where someone takes a device apart, pulls all the keys out, finds a weakness, say, in the firmware update scheme, and can now compromise any device, no matter where it is. Uh, with man in the middle attacks or, you know, pushing, uh, you know, a, a, a DNS rewrites and so on and, and, and making it pull bad firmware from somewhere else. So really, you know, the dangerous attacks are the ones that you want to concentrate your time on because annoying attacks are very hard to protect against and may not be worthwhile. Um, but it does depend on your budget. Uh, one of the terms that's just used quite a lot in, uh, in, in computer security is the attack surface. So basically, this is the sum of all the possible vectors that could compromise a product's security. So it could be you know, a hardware weakness, could be a software weakness, could be a networking weakness or a network stack weakness. And it'd only take one weakness to get in, um, at which point, generally, the, the size of the surface is immaterial because it only needs one weak point, the, the Achilles heel, essentially, of the product. So the, the really number one rule of security for absolutely anything, IoT or otherwise, is minimizing the size of the attack surface. Uh, if you give the attacker less things to try, the chances they're going to find a problem uh, are lower because actually you've been able to concentrate your efforts of, of testing and validation and so on on the exposed parts. So really always minimize the, the, rule, the size of the attack surface. Uh, it gives you less work to do. It makes it harder for the attacker. Generally a very good thing all over. So just going to go sort of following on from, from talking about attack surface to talk about general hardware attacks. Uh, so we're starting at the hardware and we're going to go to network stack and sort of server side at the end. Um, talking about hardware and secure boot. Um, so there are lots of hardware attack factors. Um, I mean, generally, these are the things which are used during development. Um, 
the very obvious ones are, are, are debug ports, JTAG or single wire debug, single wire debug. Um, things like accessible spy or EMMC buses, which might have uh, yeah, the, the, the code that's running on there or a file system. Uh, there's an awful lot of attacks on embedded Linux devices where people essentially hold the processor and reset, connect an SD card reader to the EMMC bus and actually pull out the entire file system image. Um, you know, you can do encryption and so on, but that, that gets actually quite hard. There's surprisingly few um, cheap and available um, uh, CPUs that capable of running Linux have good secure boot characteristics, uh, but definitely not very well documented ones. Um, you know, and spy flashes are almost every sort of uh, hacking of an embedded Linux device involves. We put a test probe over the spy the spy bus and uh, the spy chip and, and pull out pull out U-boot to the kernel and so on and start looking for weaknesses. Um, that's a very obvious one. You know, one of the things here is ideally, you know, don't have these 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 test points on your board on your production board, by all means have them on your development board, but take them off on your production board. Um, even better than that is to actually enable security modes of the processes involved here that fuse off these, these interfaces permanently. So there is no way, and it's not just like I can desolder the chip and get to the pins anyway. Um, but obviously the harder you make it, the, 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 the more money an attacker has to spend uh, on, on hacking your device and the, the, the more likely they'll go and hack something else instead. Um, there are some links here which are very long. Don't worry, they'll be clickable in the, in the presentation we send out. But there's some great ones here. We've got you know, external DRAM memory capture during sleep. So devices that, that go to sleep, you, you put freeze spray on the DRAM to, to prevent the contents from leaking, uh, put it in another machine and pull the contents out and you know, get, get passwords and stuff from there. There's actually been some stories in the last couple of weeks about, about a new attack on that. Um, decapping and bond wire access. So there are several embedded processes that don't actually have flash on die, they have flash in package, uh, and actually it's not encrypted. And they're relying on the fact that it's all in one blob of plastic. However, nitric acid can get through plastic. Uh, and there are people who have, uh, you know, they, they just decap the chips, hook onto the, the, the flash bus and pull out the code. Uh, only takes one person to do that. And then you've, you've, your code has leaked. It's much, much harder if the, the flash is actually on the same die as the processor with no bond wires to access. Uh, really weird ones, master on decoding. Um, that's a, actually a great, a great post there about uh, using photographs of a die to pull out the, the mask ROM in there. You know, mask ROM is not safe. It is, it's fairly easily um, programmed basically using top, top metal layer uh, on, in, in the silicon process. And you can get at this, take pictures, and, and then there's some software that these guys have done which uh, allows you to actually pull that out and get the binary, which is really nice. Well, not nice for you, very, very nicely done. The, the, the blog post is good. Um, and there are many more. Um, there's actually more than these ones. Timing attacks, very interesting one. This was uh, this post at DEF CON 22. I saw the presentation there. It was actually really nice. It was uh, attacking the pin code of, I believe, uh, Hugh Bridge at the time of Philips Hugh Bridge. Um, and it's been since patched, but essentially they were using uh, STR comp um, to, to check the pin. And so once you got the first digit right, if you iterated on the first digit, it would take slightly longer on average to do the next comparison. And they could actually, over a network, uh, manage to, to de deduce this timing information and, and work out each, each number at a time and, and claim the whole pin completely remotely with no, no physical access, which is really interesting. Power analysis attacks, again, that's really interesting. Um, that's, that, that link is a, a, a book to a, a Amazon book on, uh, on tracking smart cards, um, which has obviously been a very big thing in, in cable TV and so on, especially in Europe for a while. Uh, there's actually a, a sort of a side channel of that, a different side channel attack, which was recently uh, an, um, presented at a security conference, which is the screaming channels attack, which is where you can actually use sidebands uh, of the, the, the transmitted radio signal to actually see the crypto operations happening adjacent to the radio on the same die. Very, very hard thing to, to deal with. And um, it's gonna be interesting to see how silicon vendors um, uh, who are pushing for tighter and tighter integration of processor and radio, how they're gonna deal with that. Um, and then this is the last one down on here is, is glitch attacks. Um, this is the, the Chip Whisperer page. Um, Chip Whisperer is a, a, you know, a hobbyist priced power analysis tool that uh, allows you to do power glitching and, and control signals and, and look at power signatures and so on to actually try and recover encryption keys. These are all things which you can worry about. And the more, you, you know, there's, as, as I said, you can go to almost any depth to worry about these things. It depends what, what your attack vectors uh, are, you know, what your worst case is and what you're trying to prevent. Um, lots of things to be aware of though there. 
So secure boot, uh, really it sounds very obvious. The first step to securing a system is ensuring it only runs the code it's supposed to be running. Um, this gets harder the more code there is in a system. Um, that also sounds obvious. Um, but securing the boot chain, for example, on Linux is hard. Um, you know, securing, making sure you can boot a known version of U-boot is one thing. Um, making sure that only boots a secure kernel is another thing. And making sure the file system is secure is yet another thing. And then making sure that none of the runtime uh, things can be compromised as well. I mean, there's the, the, the classic Linux attacks tend to be, you know, uh, escaping commands into uh, fields on a built-in web browser. Um, uh, and, you know, that will still work even if you have a fully secure boot chain, uh, because it's exploiting the software you, you, you've already trusted. Um, so generally, this, this, that also points to the smaller the attack surface, the better. Um, so we actually don't do stuff that high up. I'm, I'm, I, my previous startup, we've, we've, we shipped one of the first embedded Linux devices. So I'm very well aware of, of how Linux works. It's, it's very good for many things. Um, the security effort for it is pretty hard. So it is, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, there are people who will help you on that, but there's a whole lot of things about when you have 100 packages making up your distribution, um, how do you trust them? How do you know when updates are available? And so on. And you know, there's, there's been many things there, many uh, stories over the past few years about you know, glibc vulnerabilities, for example. Um, MCUs have a much smaller attack surface. Um, on die memories are very hard to interfere with, like I've said. So that's kind of what the bit we're going to cover here. Uh, a lot of these things can, these concepts can be extended, obviously, um, but it, it gets more and more specialist the closer to a specific application you are. So, in two essential things about secure boot authentication and encryption. Um, a lot of secure boot does just authentication. Um, often this is just done with an asymmetric crypto. So the code for a device is signed with a private key. Um, there's a public key in the device, which you kind of expect to leak at some point, someone will get the public key out. Um, but basically this verifies that the code has not been modified before it executes, it executes it. However, the hacker can still look at the code. Maybe they can find a runtime issue with it. But, but really, you know, the, the public key is, is it, it doesn't matter if it leaks. Um, the attacker still can't run arbitrary code. Um, it's, a, it's good protection. Generally, uh, quite a few Linux systems have this as a, as a boot method. Uh, they have the option of, of doing this. Um, it's a bare minimum. Um, don't do what some companies have been caught doing is unfortunately put your private key somewhere in the actual um, uh, the distribution <laughs> by mistake. Uh, that, that was a consumer electronics manufacturer did that. But you know, there's there's a signing. Signing is a is a very good thing here. I mean, it, it does rely on the integrity of the signing operation, and uh, in general case, things like RSA requires quantum computers not to be really good uh, in the short term. Um, but there are many many different authentication steps you can you can take for that. The other thing is encryption. Um, the point about authentication, it doesn't prevent an attacker from looking at the code. If you encrypt it, generally then you use a symmetric key. Um, so both the, the, the key needed to encrypt and decrypt is the same. That's generally the case with AES, for example. Um, and, and there, that prevents the attacker looking at your code. Um, but it does mean that the actual key to decrypt, it has to be in every device. So that does mean that you have this, this slight issue that if a device gets hacked open with a scanning electron microscope, people can then read your code. But however, if it's still signed, they still can't modify it. Um, generally, with most security stuff, the thing you're trying to do is just raise the bar all the time. You're trying to make it harder and harder for people to actually uh, attack your device. Maybe they'll go and attack something easier. It's just like you know, having a, a lock on a bicycle. Um, you know, if, if there's a locked bicycle next to an unlocked bicycle, the thief will probably take the unlocked bicycle as opposed to trying to, trying to um, break your lock. Uh, it's, it's, you just need to be faster than the, the next, next slowest person. In an ideal world, um, secure, secure Boot would, would actually be able to protect these keys in hardware. Um, this is one thing which I know some silicon vendors are working on. There's definitely some, there's lots of different approaches to it. Uh, but really, the, the, in a perfect world, software never gets to see these keys. Um, if software have, has access in any way to encryption or, or signing keys, the problem is, is that software has bugs uh, and I mean, hardware has bugs too, but you know, but software has bugs uh, and, and there's a chance that there will be a software attack which manages to recover these keys. Now, if the keys are only available to a crypto block, uh, then it actually makes it very, very hard 
for a software bug to expose these things. So it's just another layer of protection as well. But I haven't seen this in any MCUs yet. I'm pretty sure it's coming in a couple from security people I've talked to at various semiconductor manufacturers. But uh, that's kind of the perfect situation. Um, some have features that can approximate this, though. You do have things like uh, PCROP on ST processors, readout protection, which allows you to essentially um, lock down parts of code after they've, they've executed. So you can have a, a, the very initial boot code can execute some crypto operations and then lock itself out. Essentially, that, that part of memory is now completely inaccessible to any code that runs afterwards. And it's only in the case of a hardware reset does that, that, uh, that, that protection gets get unlocked and then the trusted code starts executing again but you know there's there's things there that which, which are very detailed i won't go into in in detail at this point but it's it's uh that's that's actually a, a good thing if you can have it but even better is actually having a, a sort of crypto and key storage block combined so just finishing up the hardware part uh, general hardware advice um make it hard to probe disable the debug interfaces don't store anything unencrypted on external memory uh, there's lots of attacks which can do things like swapping external storage, um, trying to, to make yourself susceptible to that. Um, boot protection, encrypt and sign. Um, if you can have unique encryption keys per device, that's even better. The problem is managing the distribution, storage, and so on of these keys is a pain. Um, you know, if you have if you have essentially a one-time cipher, it's perfect security. I can break one device. I have no way of doing anything on the next device, but that would mean I'd have to have separate upgrade files for every device. Um, and if I'm doing this secure, you know, it, there's, there's then the thing of like, well, I'm having a server and it'll, re it'll encrypt the upgrade for the, the device that's asking for it. But that means my server now has these encryption keys on it. And then I may want to have an HSM at that end to, to, to hold these and protect these keys. And that goes on and on and on. And you've, you've essentially improved security, but you've made operational security a bigger thing. Uh, and you've made it a lot more expensive to, to serve upgrades, for example. One other thing here is making a distinction between development and production devices. So this is something we actually do at Electric in pretty, pretty, uh, pretty strongly here, uh, in that developers do not need to be running on production, devi production devices. Uh, you know, you can have devices which have got more debug interfaces exposed, have lower security keys, don't require an HSM to sign builds. Uh, they still have signing, but they sign with a lower security key. Now, these ones are only ever used within the, the developer, development um, process. Uh, in, essentially, it means that uh, you do have a slight different uh, hardware expense. You have to do two different types, different keys, and so on. Uh, and Apple did this as well in, in their production process. Development hardware could have could accept development keys, um, but really, this is good because it gives developers freedom. Uh, and, and the problem is, if you have everything having to have production keys, you end up having to weaken your operational security and so on by allowing developers to sign code, untested code, unverified code. Uh, uh, for for which will run on production devices, which is generally not needed in the real world. Um, it just prevents software developers from whining. Um, uh, but you know, if you have this distinction, you, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, other good things: uh, making sure your MCUs has high quality entropy source on die. A good true run, random number generator is very useful. There's actually been several articles about influencing these. Um, so make sure you can whiten the output as well of your your TRNG because it could be influenced by power and clock stuff um, use constant time algorithms in critical areas comparing for example comparing you know crypto output for example very good to have a constant time algorithm there um, there are some interesting differential attacks on uh, I think it's on some AES stuff uh, I can't remember now, but fairly recently I, I read some stuff on that and tinfoil hats obviously very good uh, especially if you're going to compete in the tinfoil hat competition at, at DEFCON so switching from hardware to transport security um, this section is shorter than it used to be. Um, pretty much now, uh, you know, sort of four, four, four years ago, I was telling people, you know, don't roll your own, please try and use TLS. Now, nowadays, there's really no excuse not to use TLS. Um, there's a couple of reasons why. Um, one of the reasons is that ARM bought the commercial spin-off of Polar SSL or Tropic SSL. Uh, Polar SSL became a commercial product uh, Tropic SSL was a spin-off of that, which was BSD licensed. But then there was uh, the, the the final, um, so the, the the latest version became Embed TLS, and it's actually BSD licensed. So it's a very permissive license. You've got to acknowledge it's being used, but it's very high quality. They're maintaining it. They have a reputation to uphold. So Arm are actually paying for this, and to show how how uh, you know uh, how unrestricted that license is, if you didn't know already, 
Um, some of ARM's competitors, for example, uh, Espressif, who makes some uh, Wi-Fi chips, a Chinese vendor, they use Embed TLS. They're not even using it on an ARM processor. Um, it, it's, it's good software. Um, I think James Mickens did a good presentation um, uh, on, on, uh, on security recently. If you, if you search for Usenex security, uh, James Mickens, uh, it's hilarious, um, but I think he, you know, one of the, one of the slides he has is TLS is the only thing that's good and pure in the world. Um, I mean, really what it is, it, it's, it's not just encryption, it's not just the key exchange, it's not just the authentication of, of a device. Um, it's really, the structure is very, very subtle when designing um, OTA you know, protocols that have transport layer security protocols, there's a lot of possible attacks. TLS is, has been battle tested a lot. Um, and, and so it's, uh, it's, it's very good. Um, I mean, it's, it is, it, this is actually, this is just, just use TLS as something out of the top and I've read that like symmetric encryption. There is a version of TLS which will do symmetric encryption. Don't use that. Um, you know, that, that's not really what anyone uses, but that's more, it's more about, the slide is more about transport security can have symmetric encryption. Um, but that's bad because again, just like it is for secure boot, we've got to have the key in both places. Um, so just a little bit about TLS and DTLS. I, this is a slightly aged slide. Really nobody uses RC4 anymore. Um, but really, there's this TLS 1.2 is sort of the minimum these days. TLS 1.3 has just recently come out. Uh, not many people are doing it on Embedded yet. I don't believe Embed TLS has TLS 1.3 yet. Uh, one of the commercial packages, Wolf SSL, does. It has some performance improvements, but it's not necessarily particularly more secure at this point. Um, but, you know, newer is, is better in software generally. Um, one of the things about, uh, about TLS is it has a lot of options. There are a lot of cipher suites that can be supported. Keep it simple. Uh, so if you have both sides, you own both sides, you know what the server is going to be accepting, you know, narrow it down just to uh, a, a cipher suite that you can trust that is well known um, uh, and, and, you know, has, uh, has a lot of support. AES GCM is one of, the, one of the best things here. It actually has less overhead per packet and so on. Um, but, you know, there's, TLS is a, is, is a big ball of wax. Uh, you don't need all of it. Um, DTLS is the equivalent, but for, for stateless connections, for, for uh, uh, datagram type connections, very, very similar. Um, uh, and, and again, still good. And again, supported by embed TLS. Um, the issues actually in, in, that have been found in, in TLS over the years, uh, Heartbleed was actually an option. So uh, there's a, an option which was, which was uh, Heartbeat, um, the, the Heartbeat option, which very few people used. It was found to be a terrible, terrible bug in OpenSSL's heartbeat implementation. Um, and, and really, you know, if you didn't have that option turned on, you would never, you would never have been exposed to that. So this is one of the reasons why you, you uh, turn off features you don't need, as it says here. Uh, there have been PKI cert validation issues because PKI stuff is fairly complex. Um, but issues are found in fixed frequently. So use maintained implementation. That's important and stay current with it. Uh, generally, for trans transit layer security, don't invent something new because you'll have to prove how good it is to people who won't believe you. Um, they'll just say, why didn't you use TLS? Um, ensure your implementation stays current. Um, so that's actually following security news or ensuring your provider does. You will need to update this. There's no such thing as a TLS stack which hasn't had an update. Um, there are various vendors who go, we put TLS in ROM on our chips. It's great. And it's like, that's not great. You need to be able to update it. Um, so use and maintain TLS. And as well, you know, the, again, there are keys. Um, so protect your TLS keys, protect your CA appropriately. Don't just stick it in your, in your repo, for example. There, there are things there which are important, um, uh, both on the device side and operationally uh, with your developers and so on. So uh, moving on to identity and provisioning. Um, unique identity is a very good thing. One of the problems with IoT devices in general and manufacturing is that manufacturers like making completely identical devices. Uh, they like loading one flash image and it not changing and all this type of stuff. And they don't like uh, individuality because manufacturing is all about making the same thing as cheaply and, and uh, identically as possible. Um, so one of the things here is that, you mean know, IoT devices obviously have to have a unique identity. You need to know that device A is different from device B. But cloning is a bad thing. Um, so one of the problems here is actually how you provision devices with a unique identity, how your manufacturing process works, uh, how you can ensure that you know, there aren't duplicates in the field, that 
uh, you're aware of you know, the, the data about the unique provisioning of a device is securely transported from a factory, which may have an intermittent connection, for example, back to somewhere safe. Um, how you can tell that the factory isn't running a third shift and, and they can clone devices. Uh, what the factory is doing with their IP, which is a completely separate bit really from, from identity and provisioning is like a, how you do software distribution securely. Um, but unique per device secrets are ideal. Um, generally you won't get this from the chip manufacturer. Do not rely on device IDs, die IDs on, on chip, but chip vendors often go, there's a unique ID in, in, the, uh, in, in, this, in this chip. What they're giving you is a unique ID. Absolutely, it is a unique ID. However, it is not a cryptographically secure unique ID. Generally, if you look at unique IDs, you'll find they look very, very similar on um, between you know chips in the same batch. And it's because actually a part of the unique ID is the X and Y position of that chip on the wafer uh, and a wafer number. So uh, you know that that's problematic if if um, if uh, those iterate within within small constraints um, and it's actually quite easy to guess them. Um, so, you know, if you're gonna have a unique to personalized secret, that's ideal, you can have to store it somewhere. If it's a server-side database, you have to make sure that database stays secure. So there are a whole of operational security things around that, uh, around manufacturing as well. That's one of the things actually we deal with pretty well with Electric Imp, um, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, some of the other things here is like assuming your communications channel has been breached. Um, how can you still verify a device is, is authentic? So if someone has your TLS keys, what can you do over a comprised, compromised channel to check you're, you're actually not talking to an attacker or someone spoofing something? Um, really one of the ways you can do this is, is, is using sort of a challenge response. You send a challenge to the device, which the device can only answer using a piece of secret information, which no one else is privy to. Um, and it's just cryptographic operation, very easy to do sort of, sort of SHARs and, and ND5s and so on of these things. Um, and you can you can you can have multiple layers of this as well. So have have like a bootloader sign something and signed by an operational um, part, uh, essentially to to build up sort of a chain of trust. Um, really having an approach for if a device does get breached, if security gets breached, if you need to roll your TLS keys, for example, how will you do that securely uh, without actually bringing too many other attacker uh, you know compromised devices onto the new platform? This type of thing is pretty useful for that. Um, something you should think about is really, you know, how do you recover from certain attacks? Uh, it's, it's not just how you design it, it's, it, it's designing it for longevity, which means, you know, you're gonna have a plan of attack if something goes terribly wrong. Um, one other thing here actually men worth mentioning is, is data signing. So there are some applications where really, you know, valuable data, you may wanna sign it. Um, and part, part of this is compartmentalization. Um, so the example here, an electricity meter reading is a high value, a high value piece of data. Um, and if you actually have a metering IC, which is say delivering these readings, it can have its own internal secret and cryptographically sign every reading uh, to prove it hasn't been modified. And so the IoT system, uh, any part which has updatable code, is connected to the internet, runs a network stack, it's actually set on a separate processor and then that just transports both the, the datum and the signature up to the cloud. And in the cloud, something there can verify that the signature matches the data and hence I'm going to believe the reading. Um, you know, there aren't, it just doesn't go down to like, you know, it could technically go down to an I2C sensor. You could have a, you could have a, um, a, a, sen a temperature sensor which actually provides you signed temperature readings. Uh, which would make it very hard to actually to check. But, you know, there are various other things about replay tax and so on. But, you know, th there are things that you could do to make devices secure down to the end point. The problem is, is that, you know, if, if anyone is tampering with a bus connected to the CPU, technically they could also, if they want to muck up a temperature reading, put free spray on it as well, or, or put a blowtorch on it to, to give it a very high reading. And, and there it doesn't matter if your readings are signed, they're still bad because the actual device installed has been compromised. But anyway, that's something to bear in mind. Um, quite a lot of people like this because it's pretty low cost cryptographically to do. It provides an additional layer of, of uh, assurance that the data being transported is fine, even if everything else in the path has been compromised. Uh, lastly on this part, provisioning. Um, provisioning is one of those things which, uh, you know, it often is, it comes about late in the design um, sort of sequence because basically, all the proof of concepts and so on has been provisioned by the engineer who, who has been developing it, or the team of engineers who've been developing it. But really, you know, the actual installation procedure, how do you 
make sure you can get a device connected to the backend servers with all the metadata it needs to actually work in its application. That could be install location, it could be customer, it could be room, it could be you know machine it's connected to, whatever. That's actually pretty critical. Um, there's a whole lot of attacks about reprovisioning, um, a whole lot of attacks about replay, you know, replaying a provisioning, for example. Those things have to be addressed because every single device has to be provisioned. You've got to try and make it simple. You've got to think a lot about this in order to um, make this something which people do correctly. Um, the problem is when people have very hard, complex provisioning procedures, they tend to be performed wrong, they require support, and then people find shortcuts around them and, and will end up weakening the security of the entire system because, oh, well, this is too hard, but if you hold down this button and do something else, you can, you can get it online quicker and you find out a whole lot of devices have been installed like that uh, because installers will, will, will work out the, the quickest and easiest way to get the thing installed um, and, and in theory working whether or not it actually has hurt security at the time. So provisioning is something which is, you know, tends to be thought about a lot in, in consumer devices because if people don't can't provision a device, it becomes a shop return uh, and returns are expensive. Um, but actually often the, the provisioning of uh, industrial devices is actually pretty bad uh, because they assume the installer is is motivated and has enough time and so on. But you know, with the volume of IoT devices going out there, if someone has to put a thousand devices into a, a single location, they're going to get pretty annoyed with a with a bad provisioning process. So that is something you've got to think about a lot and obviously affects security as well. The final, final part, I'm going to talk about software updates. Um, now, I, I previous versions of this one, I said the update pro process should be fail safe. I think these days, this day and age, everything, it must be fail safe. So every device must be able to take updates. Uh, that's not exactly a big surprise for anyone, uh, really with no user intervention. So the problem is with users is they don't have time for this stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's people do not upgrade their fridges, they do not update whatever else. Uh, you know, the, the provisioning process, the OTA upgrade has to be able to be carried out by the vendor, really, who's responsible for the software. Because if they found a bug and they need to update, they need to patch, they consider it important enough to, there is no reason why a device should not take that update. Um, so no user intervention is very important, must be secure, obviously, must be fail safe. Um, power goes out at weird times, uh, the internet goes out at weird times, uh, you know, this stuff has to recover. Um, updates are usually disruptive, so there needs to be architecture around that process, so normal, normal interruption is, is uh, minimally affected. So that could be, you know, that if there is any downtime at all, or, you know, in between uh, times a machine is used on a manufacturing flow, maybe there's, you know, 40 seconds that, that it's acceptable to be in, uh, in operational for, the update procedure will have to happen in that 40 seconds and must be complete within that 40 seconds. There's a whole load of things with time constraints and so on. It depends very much on the application. You know, a, a lot of home devices can just be updated overnight when no one's using them or when they're idle. But one critical part here is delivery of updates is one thing. The other thing is actually making the updates. The problem is if you have a, 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 um, a code base or a system which is inadequately documented, inadequately tested, uh, or just opaque and too much knowledge is in someone's head, uh, you know, if you have a device that's in the field for 10 years, the, the person who designed all that system has the compilers on their laptop and so on, may not be at the company anymore. Um, you need to make sure you can actually always build these updates. Um, this can be problems, you know, it can be problematic. If you, you go back to things like uh, McLaren F1 cars made in the sort of, I think, late 80s, they had a, a, a Toshiba laptop, which could talk to the ECU, and the software only exists on that Toshiba laptop. And apparently, you know, they're still trying to keep some of these Toshiba laptops alive, because even under virtualization, some of the, the software won't run properly. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, it's kind of like this car is, is, is sort of, 30 years old now, but unfortunately the tools are now 30 years old, the computers haven't aged well in 30 years. But really part of this is actually a software development life cycle uh, approach that you actually have to have a life cycle, which allows you to, for example, with none of the original engineers on the team that shipped the product still available, be able to compile, test and safely deploy an update to devices in the field. And that was actually a very significant thing in terms of software engineering workflow. Um, and it's uh, more alien to people uh, generally the, if outside of say defense uh, because really that's not something you've had to do um, connected products are this this update forever um, sort of system uh, very very quickly server-side security it's a much more mature field 
Um, there are lots of best practices for securing servers uh, if you're running your own ones. Um, you know, intrusion detection, attack mitigation, again, reducing the attack surface and so on. Um, VPCs, da da da, lots of stuff. Also, APIs. You know, check that your APIs are going to actually pass the OWASP um, uh, sort of test there about various things about time related keys and so on. There's also an IoT section there as well, which is well worth reading on the OWASP website. Um, but as with device security, it's always keeping up to date. Updating your stacks, updating your OS, updating your your your, your TLS, and so on. Um, just just vigilance is kind of the, the the main the main thing to bear in mind. So, poll question two. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Where is? It? Oh. Here. Ah. Okay. There we go. Hey. So this question is really about um, UL 2900 cybersecurity certification. So uh, there is one of the things I find challenging about security is that there are a lot of people doing pen testing and, and, and so on. Um, but it's very hard to pick between them. You know, you pick the big organization or the, the small, more agile one. Uh, you know, who's good at testing? Don't really know. Uh, and then when you test, there are very few standards to test against. Um, UL came into this, so UL is under Underwriters Laboratories. They're best known for things like uh, electrical safety testing. Um, however, they, they do do other things. They've long done PCI compliance, looking for, for payment systems uh, security. Uh, and, and what they did a couple of years ago is develop, actually over a fairly long period, um, a cybersecurity certification. Um, there are two of them, UL 2900-2-1, which is for medical devices, and dash 2 dash 2 which is for industrial control systems. Now, this is an arbitrary standard, obviously. Every standard is arbitrary. However, it's actually pretty good. They've thought about you know, uh, device-side attacks, fuzzing, uh, you know, physical attacks, uh, man in the middle, server-side, all these bits and pieces, and have actually made a standard for that. Um, uh, and it's independently tested. So you know, they actually test to this standard. Um, uh, it's an independent thing. There's a recertification every year. We've actually recently completed our second recertification. Our first recertification, as we did certification a couple of years ago, recertification just this year. Um, but it's, it changes every year. So the standards move and evolve as they should. And the testing has to be redone. The certificate has to stay current because, as I said at the very beginning, you can't just say it's secure, great, walk away. Um, it's good to see actually the, the response to this thing that actually people do find this important. Um, it's my belief, really, that, and one of the reasons why you know, we engaged with UL early on was that. Uh, security has to have some sort of mark that people can trust because really at some point the real way to make sure connected products become secure is for buyers to say I will not buy without this certification um, and that is kind of a kingmaker in the certification business I guess but you know you all do it already for, for product safety uh, if I'm selling something in Best Buy it has to have UL cert if it has a mains plug on it uh, because essentially that's what they use for, for reducing their risk um, as, as a reseller now, if I'm selling through Amazon, I don't need UL. I can sell with ETL approval, which is a bit cheaper to get. Still a very good thing to have. But, you know, there are a couple of main players in the electrical safety field, ETL and, uh, and UL. Uh, but UL have, have done this cybersecurity first. And I think it's actually a very, it's a good step forward. So, so we've supported it from the beginning. And um, coincidentally, we're still the only um, platform which has actually had this security certification done on it. We have had, uh, there are plenty of products which have had it done on separately. Um, and if a product wants us to use the U, get UL certified when they're built on our platform, there's much less work to do because UL have done the fuzzing and the source code analysis and all this stuff like that um, on our system and, and declared it good so they don't have to retest that part. Anyway, that was a good one there. So we're just going to, we'll go and get to the final bit, which is the contractual obligation part. Um, I am from Electric Imp and I am the CEO. And uh, so I'm going to talk about Electric Imp just for two slides, really, really short. Um, what we do. We offer a secure platform that connected device makers can build great products with. Uh, and really, I think that's, that's kind of the critical bit there is that we have a platform. Um, we've architected it in a way which allows us to, to offload a lot of the security maintenance from our customers. So we've architected and built a field pr proven platform. It's been shipping commercially and commercial products for five years now, but over five years um, with developers for about six years. 
and it incorporates security best practice at every level, everything from service to, to secure boot to all these things. Um, it's delivered as a service, which means you have continuous OS monitoring and updates. So we actually monitor possible attacks on devices in the field. Um, and this is independent of the application. So essentially we, we have a, a separation between application and operating system. Uh, you think of it much in the same way that Apple will, will push out an iOS update for your phone, uh, which will you know, deal with issues in the TLS stack. And it doesn't mean you have to change you know, Instagram or Facebook apps. It just it, it maintains security for the applications. And really this, this allows our customers to concentrate engineering effort on, on their product, um, you know, what their product does, what actually differentiates their product. Because uh, you know, it is actually quite hard for, for product vendors to sell security and you know, the details of how, how well they've picked the Cypher suites and the TLS stack. Most of their customers just want something that works they don't have to worry about. So really this, this allows for the vision of effort. Um, what's unique about it? Um, we do this application isolation, even on very small low power embedded devices. So even on single chip um, MCUs and radios, uh, you get to run application code in a device side VM, which provides that isolation. Um, so you can run your, your uh, application local code right at the edge. Uh, but also we actually have a cloud side VM for every device. What this means is that the, the, the trust relationship between the device and the server is very much simplified. There's electric code running at both ends. Uh, and, and that means that the device only has to trust the server. And then any back end that you may send the data on to, whether it's um, you know, AWS or Google or Azure or whatever, uh, any back end there, the, the trust relationship there is a cloud to cloud one. So that can actually use much more heavyweight procedures and, and, and security and so on, in terms of like full PKI, for example, without needing to put a full root certificate chain, uh, root certificate store on the device, which costs money and so on. So it's a, a kind of a different way of doing it. There's a lot more information on our website. Um, we deal with a complete life cycle, everything from manufacturing uh, or prototyping, then mass manufacturing, then uh, deployment updates in the field and so on to end of life. Everything is included in the platform. And we also actually have cellular, uh, which is pretty interesting that we're taking care of uh, the cellular carrier part as well. Um, has the, great, the same great security. The UL2900 certification is currently just on the Wi-Fi devices because UL don't currently have a plan for uh, how they test cellular, but we're working with them on that. Um, uh, essentially, one of the parts there is it's much harder to do a man in the middle on a cellular. Definitely not impossible, as has been shown at many conferences, but uh, it's, it's, it's harder. And so uh, that, that's one of the things there, which is cellular has some inbuilt transport security, which has been getting better between 2G and 2G, which has been comprehensively cracked, and 3G, which has been mostly cracked, to LTE, which has not been cracked, but there are downgrade attacks. So anyway, um, that's all I'm going to say about Electric Imp. Uh, there's a lot more stuff there, and you can ask questions. Uh, finally, here's kind of the questions. It's fun things to do. Go to a hacking conference. Um, it's actually quite in, kind of interesting. Uh, we had, when we, I, I went, every year we, we go to, to DEF CON um, and take all our interns there as well, and, and some of our other guys there uh, come to DEF CON with us. Um, Starbucks sent their entire InfoSec team there, which was, which was great. Uh, and they bought some machines long for people to try and hack. Uh, so, you know, it, it is actually a, a, a viable corporate expense. Um, uh, and you will learn a lot. And part of it is understanding the mindset of the people who are trying to break into these systems. So, you know, that, that's actually part of the, the part is, is know your enemy. Um, so, so go to this thing. It, it's fun anyway. And uh, if you can expense a trip to Vegas on the company, that's great usually as well. Um, lots of parties too. Uh, but also take things apart. Um, you know, engineers like taking stuff apart. So, so take apart other devices and, and see whether you can find your, find a way in. Anyway, so that's that's. Well, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, and we have, I'm afraid we have less time for the questions, but I will still answer answer as many as I can. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, basically, shall I, read, shall I read off the question to uh, Hugo? Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, can you tell us about any electric customers who require strong security? Um. There are customers. I mean, there's someone on our website mentioned. Um, it depends what you're doing. Obviously, we have some customers who, who don't have very high security needs, but everyone gets the same level of security. So uh, generally, you find that public companies, uh, the people that are most, most demanding on security because they have responsibilities to shareholders beyond uh, you know, the normal responsibilities to, to their customers. Um, and, and so these people are most worried about that. Um, one of the things we did... Uh, we went through a lot of penetration testing and so on for, for companies like Pitney Bowes, um, who actually have uh, devices which sell currency postage um, connected via ele the electric and platform. Uh, they use a private cloud as well, so they actually have the devices connecting via servers they own, 
um, which is very important to them. And, and they have hundreds of thousands of devices in the field on our platform. So that's actually a, a pretty interesting uh, customer for security requirements. Um, they also have late, low latency requirements and so on. And we have other ones like Eaton who do uh, smart grid stuff. Smart grid is one of those areas where security is very critical. Um, and it extends beyond what we provide, frankly. Um, you know, there's, we provide a lot of security in one part, but if you're, if you're worried about a, a nation state attack, which is one of the things you generally have to be worried about with grid security, um, you know, there's, there's multiple layers and, and you know, we, we've actually worked with them to, to, to talk about some of the options they could do to improve security beyond, beyond us. And it really has to be different teams doing some parts of the security because you do not want everything architected by one company. Um, you know, you, you want to have it so that the, the system is safe uh, and performant in the event of pretty much any eventuality. Uh, and so it's, a lot of that is, is done by, uh, by, by layering security. Great. All right, next question. How can, how can a company protect against uploading malicious software to the IoT device when the attacker has physical access to the device? Isn't uploading software over Wi-Fi like in the case of electric imp devices, even more vulnerable since it could be done remotely. Well, I mean, the, the main thing here is, is is actually really, it's actually went on the, the secure boot side, really. The, the point about this is that you, you don't implicitly distrust anything. So, you know, it, it's uh, operating system updates, for example, they come over Wi-Fi. Now they're completely secure because they're both encrypted and signed. So unless you have a signing key, you can't actually make an image which the device will accept. You can tell it to try and to try and take the update; it will reject the update. So you know that there's. I mean, really, you know, the reason it, Wi-Fi isn't the point. I mean, in terms of the security of an electric imp device, we're not reliant on, say, WPA on Wi-Fi at all. That that's not the point. Um, we're 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 just as secure if we're running over an open Wi-Fi network with someone looking at all the traffic. Uh, as we are on a WPA2 network, you know, WPA2 generally, most transit layer security has been cracked. WPA2 has recently been cracked. WPA3 is not deployed yet, but technically addresses a lot of those weaknesses. I'm sure WPA3 will be cracked at some point, whether it's due due to a design issue or an implementation issue. But but really, um, it's all about you know ensuring you can trust the stuff, and that's what cryptographic signing is for. So in the case of our operating system update. Our operating system uh, is protected by a signing key. That signing key is not sitting on a laptop somewhere. It is in, in a, a hardware security module, which is a FIPS 140-2 compliant, um, essentially cryptographic box, which we have to plug into a computer, big, build, make a build, plug the HSM in, three different smart cards, three different passphrases from safes and so on, uh, allow us to sign that build. And without that process, no electric imp device in the field will accept that firmware. So it's pretty obvious if someone is making a build. Um, you know, you, a, a rogue employee can't even make a build for an electric device because they don't have access to the signing, the, the key material and so on. So part of that, there's many, many things about that, but it, that's not really, um, you know, it, it, trust is an issue, but if you design a system right, you, you can trust OTA updates. Great. All right, so um, I think we have time for just one uh, quick last question, uh, and it is uh, which security controls are being maintained by Electric Imp and which will I need to address internally? Uh, so the ones that we do um, right now, obviously we do the operating system update, and that secures your, your network stack, uh, the security stack, uh, and the virtual machine environment on there. So right now, um, the, the application code is deployed over a TLS connection, so it's only over a trusted connection. Uh, and that part doesn't, doesn't currently have signing. So right now, this is something we're planning on adding next year. Um, uh, you know, you will, customers will be able to sign their own uh, VM firmware and devices will, will be provisioned at the factory with the public key by the customer, which is not visible to Electric Imp. Well, the private key isn't visible to Electric Imp. Uh, and that will mean the devices will only run stuff that they've signed with a key that only they own. Um, so, you know, we're extending that, that trust relationship further down. Uh, to, to allow customers to actually you know, have more protection there. And very recently, we've actually protected all our, our logins and, and deployment tools uh, with uh, TOTP passwords. So, um, you know, customers can, only customers who have the correct privileges on our system 
uh, and have the right TOTP code, that's the time-based one-time password, uh, can deploy. So there's, there's levels of stuff here, uh, really, but it's, it's one of the things there which, you know, it's constant improvement. You know, we're still adding more things on our side to ensure that uh, customers have the, the best security experience. And, uh, you know, we're also very willing to work with companies who are looking for custom stuff for something we don't address. Um, we can talk with their security guys and, and try and work out a way that, uh, that, that we, can, we can help address those things. Um, you know, as I said, security is no place for complacency. So, uh, you know, really it's a, it's a continuum. We're trying to make it better all the time. Great. Well, hey, there are a number of uh, additional uh, questions, but we will answer everyone directly um, via their email uh, if you uh, have any questions. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today's uh, webinar. And thank you, Hugo, for such a wonderful and in-depth presentation. With that, I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you.